Appreciate your attendance tonight. Uh, I want to ask you by way of introduction. Do you know what the Dalmatian has to do with the firehouse or fire station? Uh, I've got some pictures to show that there is a connection if you've not noticed that before. Here's a picture of a Dalmatian up on a, a fire apparatus, horse-drawn fire apparatus from 100 plus years ago. And uh, apparently there's a connection there because Dalmatians <clears throat> used to be called coach dogs. They get along very well with horses. And uh, well, in, I guess the first use uh, that they thought of was to guard against horse thieves. But then when in the days of, the, of the, this fire wagon, with, they needed lots of horses. In fact, San Francisco Fire Department had at one time 450 horses at their disposal. And so lots of different Dalmatians to calm the horses and they bonded well and uh, especially when the horses had to be on scene for a long time or at the house for a long time. Uh, and so, you know, that explains why Dalmatians had a part in the fire station back then. But it doesn't necessarily explain what the Dalmatian has to do with fire station today. Uh, I did have a slide with some information that's not important, but did you know that the Dalmatian used to be a siren because they would run out in front of that horse-drawn buggy and, uh, and if people would see the Dalmatian running, they would know that a horse uh, and uh, fire engine, what do you call those, apparatus, would be shortly there behind. So it served kind of like a, like a siren. But uh, that was then, this is now, and there are still Dalmatians that are a part of uh, certain fire stations in America. Uh, the station in New York, Ladder 20, uh, has, I don't know if it's one or a number of Dalmatians, but you'll still see it. It's not just old pictures and parades anymore. Why is that? It's about tradition, right? That's what we're talking about. The same reason why in just about three weeks, many of us will reach for our loved one at the stroke of midnight and give them a big kiss. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Did you know that that is a tradition that is rooted in a superstition that in, or in doing so, you would ensure that the relationship lasted for the rest of the year? Who knew that you had to do that to ensure such a thing. And with all the noise, I could show you a video of what took place at the Rice House last year. It was crazy. It was uh, amazing with the kazoos and all the screaming. Uh, there was a time where people used to believe that the evil spirits needed to be fended off with noise and firecrackers. And you thank the Chinese for that. And they would scream and keep the evil spirits away. Same way with the saying of bless you after a sneeze, right? Lots of traditions we do. If we knew why people did that originally, I wonder if we'd even do it anymore. But, you know, uh, according to my research, uh, it was believed that man's soul could be inadvertently thrust from his body by an explosive sneeze. And it makes sense, right? Because spirit and breath are kind of synonymous there. You expel too much out of it, you might lose your spirit. And the bless you was a protective oath uttered to safeguard the temporarily expelled and vulnerable soul from being snatched by Satan. You don't say bless you if you do say it. For that reason, I'm sure. And there's many other suggestions and beliefs that were a part of that. I believe that you're, you're getting the sense of what I'm talking about though. We all keep traditions. Some of the traditions that we keep, we don't even know why we're keeping them. They wouldn't make sense to us if we knew. Uh, I'm sure hiding eggs is in that realm. So what is that all about? Uh, but we do it. It's fun. Family traditions, especially this time of year, they're meaningful. They don't have to be significant or, or major in order to be re meaningful. Uh, but yet we all have something that we hold on to and treasure and is heartwarming for us. But in the religious realm, it's not all about cute and feel-good stuff. Uh, religious realm, this is a serious topic. The Apostle, Apostle Paul enjoined upon us certain traditions as we studied uh, a couple weeks ago or last week uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 that you need to keep these traditions which were handed down by the apostles and uh, felt so strongly about it that in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 6, he said that, 
in the name of the Lord Jesus that, that the Thessalonians should withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2, he says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But you know, those passages are the exception to the rule when it comes to tradition in the New Testament. The word paradosis uh, is a uh, uh, handing down or handing uh, aside uh, something and uh, tradition. In fact, when Jesus says the traditions which you hand down, if you look at the Greek words, he's basically saying the traditions that you tradition because that's what it is to, to pass it down. And so uh, of the 13 times that it's used in the New Testament, 10 of those times are used in a negative connotation. And so traditions are not all created equal. And we need to, of course, make sure that we understand the distinction between uh, a tradition that is handed down that we need to keep and one that we need to be uh, aware of and even avoid because of its human origin. In addition to that, I want to talk about what we broached this morning in our Bible class concerning uh, just the way that we have come to, to do things by manner of the, the length of time that we have grown comfortable with a certain practice, that things that can become uh, a tradition uh, in sort of an organic way like that without necessarily writing them down and adopting them uh, or ratifying them, that they just become something that we're com comfortable with. So that's... Uh, that's coming up uh, in just a minute. First, I want to give you a little background to why uh, the Jews and Pharisees and scribes got in trouble with some of their traditions. And I wanted to give you a little uh, insight into the Pharisees as it's written by uh, commentator Barnes. Uh, historically, from 175 B.C., and uh, he, he, he paints a picture about the Pharisees that in, in and of itself is not all that bad. Some admirable characteristics about the Pharisees. He says in 175, Antiochus Epiphanes of Syria made a deliberate attempt to stamp out the Jewish religion and to introduce Greek religion and Greek customs and practices. It was then that the Pharisees attained special prominence as a separate sect. The separated ones were the men who dedicated their whole lives to the careful and meticulous observance of every rule and regulation which the scribes had worked out. This they did in face of the threat directed against uh, Judaism. And so that's admirable. We would commend them for their desire to be careful and meticulous in their observance of the law, of course. And the Jews relied heavily on tradition, and, and they came to believe that uh, God had handed down uh, not just a written but an oral tradition to Moses at Sinai, and that it was the job of the scribes to, like Ezra, uh, give the sense in, ne in Nehemiah A, give the sense of the law. And so they came to believe that the sense that they handed down was the, was the interpretation of the laws, the extrapolation of the laws that God intended when he handed down the law of Moses at Sinai. And there's a quote from Phil Roberts uh, where he points this out in, a, I guess it was a bulletin article that he had written. Uh, he says, their, their hedge was no longer just a hedge, it was a law and they would condemn any who broke it. They even began to claim that their oral traditions had been delivered at Mount Sinai uh, right along with the written law. The lesson for us is, is obvious. Now I want to share with you some of the laws that were handed down as you can read if you got a hold yourself of a copy of the Mishnah. And it's really eye-opening how, how careful and meticulous they were in defining what was authorized and what was considered a violation. Okay, so, uh, and by the way, he makes reference to the hedge there that is no longer just a hedge. Uh, but oh, in the Mishnah, it is explained that the purpose of the, uh, of the scribe was to make a fence uh, about the law. That is to put around the law a wall of restrictions and injunctions 
which the Israelite would have to break through, that he would have to he'd get into this danger zone of over their restriction, over their fence, uh, kind of a zone where they're still safe in the eyes of God, but by means of uh, protecting them, they've created this, this fence. One of the examples in the in Mishnah that I thought was interesting was uh, rooted in the command in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 11 pertaining to uh, fathers and mothers instructing their children. You remember in Deuteronomy 6 verses 5 through 10 how you should talk to them as they go about here and there as they lie on their beds and uh, that it should not depart from their eyes. All of, all of that, right? Deuteronomy 11 though uh, in verse 13, we're not going to read it all, but the text is from 13 through 21. You get, in the, you get the phrase here where it says in verse 19, you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house and walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And the question was asked then, what time period is defined by the laying down of the, of the child when they lay down? Is, and what time during the night uh, could that be accomplished and still be according to the law? And here's a quotation. It says, they, they learned, the learned say until midnight, and Rabbi Gamaliel said until the morning dawn. In fact, when his sons came home from feast, he told them, uh, we have not read the Shema, that is, hear, O Israel. He told them, as the morning has not dawned, you should read it. Not this only, but wherever the wise have said until midnight, the command reaches to dawn. And why have they said till midnight? In order to keep man from transgression. So that was the purpose in, in, in delivering these kinds of rules and, and this kind of commentary to the law when these kind of questions would come up. What their goal was to keep man from tradition. All right. Uh, some examples concerning the Sabbath and the laws that the Sabbath uh, brought about in the scribe, scribal traditions. Uh, again, I mentioned the Mishnah, which is divided into six parts. The section, second section dealt with the festive seasons. And, and uh, in, concerning the Sabbath day, there were 156 pages that dealt with laws pertaining to the Sabbath. Among them are uh, laws pertaining to the burden and how it was identified. It was identified by, first of all, by its weight. The weight of a dried fig is a burden, but a half a fig is not a burden. Point number two is that if you should carry two half burdens during the same day, they add up to a full burden and therefore sin. Cold water could be poured upon warm water, but warm water could not be poured on cold because doing the latter would involve in energy or work. Uh, it was not allowed to draw or you were not allowed to draw or push chairs on the Sabbath as this might produce a rut or a cavity in the ground. And if you can do that, if you can, if you can see yourself authorizing the pulling of chair and creating a rut, then how can you, uh, how can you be honest and how can you be consistent by telling someone else that they can't take a shovel and do the same thing? And so to be safe, they outlawed the activity. You're not allowed to extinguish a fire on the Sabbath. Uh, all sorts of rules like that. Uh, others concerning the Sabbath journey and how far you were allowed to travel. And it's no wonder then that Jesus had the perspective that he did when he came on the scene in his ministry. I've got three phrases for you to share how Jesus felt about these laws. The first of which was... You've heard it said, but I say to you, which establishes Jesus as the authority. That there might have been all sorts of teachings going on by religious leaders and those who claim to be someone and those who were held in high honor. But of all those people who were talking and writing and we, in our day we would say publishing, all the people that were espousing their knowledge. He sums it all up by saying, you've heard it said, but I say to you. That's an authoritative claim, a claim that caused, 
uh, people to hear him and be amazed at his teaching because he taught with authority. So he, he swept all of that away and said, you're going to listen to what I have to say, not their traditions. He also said such things as, in chapter 15, verse 9, that their worship was in vain. And this was in the context of the scribes or, and Pharisees asking why your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders by not washing their hands when they eat bread. And so he claims that they themselves had transgressed the commandment of God by, in order to keep their tradition. And I just want to point out, based on that question alone, uh, would there have been any reason why Jesus, for the sake of peace, could not have simply asked his disciples to just go ahead and wash? You know, we, we can just, we can get along with everyone here just by uh, accommodating them. And this is their conscience. And, uh, you know, after all, they are weak. We are strong. We have knowledge that this is not uh, necessary, but we're going to just go ahead and do that for the sake of peace. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that here. He doesn't do that in other occasions where this same, uh, same kind of objection uh, arise, uh, arises. In uh, Mark chapter 7, the same kind of thing where they are questioned concerning uh, the washing of hands. And look what he says in verse 13. In Mark chapter 7. I'm sorry, not just 13, but... Uh, Verse, eight, uh, verse 9 through 13. He said, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. From which we learn that there are two ways where we can be guilty of violating tradition and sinning with God's displeasure when we honor tradition. The first of which is, as we see, when we violate God's law concerning his commandment. When our commandment is, in, is, is such that it overrides or overturns God's law, where God says, honor father and mother, but you've come up with a tradition now that somehow uh, reverses that or gets you out of that, obviously that is a sin. Uh, the second way was referenced back in Matthew chapter 15 concerning the hand washing. And the second way by which we can be guilty of, of sin with regard to tradition is when we allow a tradition to take on the authority of the word of God and begin to require it of other people as a matter of, of acceptance or fellowship. That is, if you don't do this, uh, you're not going to be accepted or, or, or by judging people as unfaithful for not uh, abiding by their tradition. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a uh, contradiction in the law of God with regard to a command he's already given. We're basically talking about the difference between binding what God has not bound and loosing what God has not loosed. Uh, in addition to his attitude as seen in these texts, it's also pretty evident, uh, well, Matthew 23, 16 says, that they are blind guides and they are leading the blind. And he says, as a result, both will fall into a pit. Here's uh, one of my favorite examples from Mark chapter 3, which was read for us at the beginning. Here's a man with a withered hand, and because of their rules pertaining to the Sabbath command, in order to build a hedge about Israel and to keep them from transgression, uh, they would have deemed what Jesus did for this man as working on the Sabbath. Surely if carrying a fig is work, then, then what he did here was work for him as well. So look at the attitude of Jesus as seen in this again. Watching them closely to see whether they might accuse him. And it says uh, in verse 5, When he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. 
as whole as the other. To me, that is uh, really, really manly. <laughs> that, that's really brave. That is Jesus going rogue on pharisaical tradition. And I admire that he was willing to do that because, as I said in the other example, it would have been likewise very easy for him to, to, uh, to get around this and, uh, and to say to this man, look, you've lived this long with a withered hand. It's just one more day. Why don't you meet me back here tomorrow and we'll get this taken care of. But he doesn't do that. There's a message here. Jesus was not going to uh, jump through their hoops or, or kowtow to their, uh, their, you know, their authoritative and uh, oppressive uh, determinations or interpretations about that law. He was going to pursue the truth. Uh, at no matter what the cost might be. Same indictment as uh, Matthew chapter 15 verse 9 talks about. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. I think you know good and well that that would be very possible and we warn regularly about that. That's, that's kind of a trademark of ours, isn't it? That's our verse. You can't use our verse. We might be tempted to say you can't use our verse against us, but of course, the verse is going to slice both ways. We need to make sure that we never act in such a way that it could be used against us. But we, we preach about that. We, books are written. I mean, I was looking at one this week uh, by Alvin Jennings. You're familiar with it, I'm sure. Traditions of men versus the Word of God. And you've got two columns there. Word of God giving you the truth. Uh, traditions of men from various denominations listed there. And we, we amen heartily. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that I wouldn't amen uh, in that book. Uh, although, don't quote me on that. I can't be responsible for everything that was written. It's not inspired. But we certainly, uh, I think, would echo the sentiment uh, of what that, that work entails. But we recognize also that we are creatures of habit and ac grow accustomed to things that we've done for a long time. It'd be possible for us to develop a tradition. We need to make sure that we guard against uh, a, uh, a uh, loyalty to that kind of tradition that would cause us to go too far with it and fall under the same kind of judgments. I'm going to give a few examples here, and I should mention at the outset that I have no intention of attempting to change any of these traditions. I'm not, uh, there's no secret agenda here. Just in my 25 years of Christianity have observed some of the things that you probably have as well. Uh, and, uh, and I thought I should mention that uh, as, as we start. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, I knew there were two things about that. I'm not trying to change them. Number two is, that the things that I have thought of to list down here, I'm not thinking that they're at all unscriptural in any way, that they are certainly approved and, and authorized by means of general authority and as an expedient way of going about the business that we're doing and glorifying God. But among the list of things that I was considering as traditions of churches of Christ are the closing prayer, for example. That's, I think, something that if you go from church to church, you can feel pretty comfortable in knowing that that's how, that's how the church is going to be dismissed. That's just how it happens, right? And we recognize, though, that uh, in Matthew 26, verse 30, when the disciples gathered together with Jesus, there are, there are verses here that say, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Uh, what is that? That's the closing song. <laughs> and, and there's no prayer there. Is, is that okay? Could we do that? Again, not asking to implement that, but could, could we? If, if that were a thing that uh, felt passionately about, well, sure, that, that'd be authorized by Scripture. Uh, and actually, I'm aware of a congregation that did, in fact, I was a part of a congregation that decided they were going to have a closing hymn and be dismissed. 
And, you know, wouldn't you believe one, one older fellow in the church as we sang our hymn and got, he stood up and started praying. <laughs> Can you believe that that would happen? Uh, you, you're not surprised probably, right? Because he, he's accustomed to the closing prayer and he's going to have himself a closing prayer. Is that appropriate? Probably not. Probably not. It's kind of a kind of a belligerent thing to do. And your elders have said we're going to sing uh, going to sing a song and be dismissed. Uh, not sure that that's a real appropriate way to handle that. Uh, we sing, traditionally sing a song after the sermon and call it the invitation song. And you know what's funny about this is that uh, uh, Barry Kirchville about 15 years ago wrote something called. Uh, like the Ten Commandments of, of Churches of Christ. And this, this was one of the things that he, he talked about. And his introduction, I think, was uh, helpful. And, and he just pointed out, you know, it's a lot easier to talk about Sabbath commands and washing hands and things like that than these things. But if you're like me and you can laugh at yourself and, and recall the times that you've met yourself coming and going with your reasoning and logic, then maybe you'll, you'll get a kick out of this and, and be able to see, just, just like I myself have been caught up in trying to explain, well, why we do it this way? I can't really find a verse, but here's all my rationale and justification anyway. So even though it makes good sense and to provide the invitation and an invitation song and to explain all the ins and outs of what a person needs to do, you don't have to look very far into the Gospels to find that when Jesus preached, uh, he didn't close his sermons that way. In fact, this morning we looked at the sower went out to sow, and then he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he sat down, you know, and he, he quit. And if you were interested in what the message meant, then you would seek him out and find, find out what, what do you mean by that and what do you want me to do? Uh, at the end of the, the greatest sermon ever preached in Matthew 5 through 7, the winds blew, the beat on the house, it fell, and great was its fall. So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his, at his teaching. It was a call, it was an invitation to be obedient uh, but, uh, you know, he didn't necessarily go into all, the, uh, all of the uh, specific details. That some of that, we kind of understand that that's going to be a driving factor in people who are seeking the Lord. It's a part of that. They're going to seek that. If you are seeking the Lord, you're going to pursue the truth about that. Um, the Lord's Table, something that was referenced in the book that we're studying. If you've read ahead a little bit, you know that there was a member who, I don't know how Gardner Hall heard about this, I don't remember that part, but they were upset that the, the Lord's Table didn't have the inscription on it, right? This do in remembrance of me. I don't know if that's a denominational inscription or, all, or if that's just if that's just for us, but uh, some people get really tied to that sort of thing and she was offended that that wasn't there. And it makes you beg the question, do we even need a table? <laughs> Would it be wrong to not have a table? Uh, the table of the Lord. Oh, wait, there's something about that. Is this, is that what that's, is that what, the, is this a holy object of furniture now? Is this like the temple? Are we in the temple? Is this like the table of showbread? No, it's just a table. It's just a platform. We can put the, we could put the trays on the, on the pew. We could, couldn't we? I know of no scripture that says, well, that's our tradition, and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but we're going to talk about how we could make some of these things wrong by, by pressing them. Brother Hall also talks about the designations on the sign. Uh, and, of course, you're aware of the fact that there are three that are approved. There's either uh, just... Church of Christ, uh, there's the Church of Christ, and then there's the, the geographical designation Church of Christ, right? And yet at the same time, we'll be very careful to teach that there's no official name given for the church. But we learn whether or not we really believe that if, uh, if at all a church deviates uh, at that in the slightest. Heard of a church that uh, called themselves a Church of Christ. There was trouble. There was trouble because you know, elders are getting notes from, the, from, from visiting members uh, talking about how you apparently don't understand that, you, that we are the Church of Christ and not a Church of Christ. 
which to me is a lack of understanding about the difference between a local congregation, which is a church of Christ, and the universal body of believers, which is not consisting of congregations, but of individuals who are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. By the way, a church of Christ is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where it says you come together as a well, not a church of Christ, but as a church. We are a church that comes together. Um, approved, another way that this could present itself would be if there was rules and uh, you know, established approved worship attire where you can't unless you have these types of things. Uh, number of meetings on, on Sunday. I was thinking about a scenario where uh, imagine that you are Imagine that you are a, living in the 1940s before the war and for 50 years that congregation has met from 9.30 to 11.30 on Sunday and then 1 to 2 after lunch. I don't know if they ever did that back then, but I've heard about that. Anyway, stick with me. 9.30 to 11.30, you go to lunch, you're right back 1 to 2. Then the war started and most everyone had to work seven days a week during the days, but they were off at nights. Can you imagine a church where they decided because of that, that we were going to meet instead of two hours and then one, that we're gonna meet three hours from six to nine Sunday evenings. And that that's not gonna cause a problem for those who've done this for 50 years. Can you hear the rhetoric already? Oh, you're not gonna wait till the very end. You're just gonna, what do you wanna sleep in? You, you really wanna just sleep in, aren't you? Or, Oh, and, you know, we can do that, whatever the change is in, in that front. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that I think we need to uh, point out is that, that, and I got a few other examples. I guess we'll uh, hit those and then I'll move on to that. But uh, auditorium layout was something else that I heard of where, you know, you got to have this kind of layout where, you know, it would be wrong. Some church wanted to meet in a circle or something. And I guess in the olden days, I think they used to have a platform and then people would be all around the platform and preachers would turn around. I wouldn't feel comfortable with that because they're like looking at my back and all. I kind of like to have you all in front of me so I can see you. But uh, anyway, by, by having a, seeing a church that does that and saying, well, that's different than what we do. Uh, and I know a denomination that does that. It must be liberal. I'm not sure that we're really, we may be a little bit more like Gardner Hall when he talks about unsound logic than we are in actually talking about what scripturally uh, matters. Um, all right, so three suggest or three points about, um, three points about justifications apart from scripture that I think we need to be aware of. First of all, one of the appeals that we and I have made in the past is, and it's not always a bad thing, we just need to be aware of what's happening, uh, and the appeal to, well, this is a tried and true method, and that smart men in the past have already decided this for us, and it was good enough for them, so it should be good enough for, for us. Uh, to which I want to I want to tell you about the story about the woman who, who always uh, cut off a couple of inches of her meatloaf before putting it on the serving plate. And her daughter asked her why she did that. And the mother said, well, I don't know. My mother always did it. And so I do it. I never asked why. So after asking her mother why she cuts an end off of her meatloaf, her mother replies, because my baking pan is two inches longer than my serving plate. And so that makes good sense. And all these t years, uh, mom was cutting it off as well, not knowing why. She just did it. She just went along with the thing, not asking questions. And uh, in fact, you can ask Brother Littmer tonight. He was telling me while we had lunch that he was talking to an elder one time uh, who attended a no class church. And he admitted to him that he didn't even know why he was a member of this no he didn't even know why he's against classes but he's an elder of this church that is opposed to having bible studies so you got this tradition it doesn't make sense but you just follow it out of loyalty to the past and uh, i would say that we should work out our own salvation and and not allow others to draw conclusions for us and sometimes 
Messing with tradition can be viewed with great suspicion, as if to say it's only a matter of time before the real changes begin. And this is a common uh, means by which brethren who are displeased with the church's uh, change, whatever it is, it might be a service time or uh, something that no one would say is unscriptural, but there's this cloud of suspicion that says it's the smoke before the fire and we know that what is coming is probably instrumental music or the removal of baptism. You know, that's where we always go. We just start throwing dirt and, and wonder if it's going to, to stick. And uh, to me, looking at something that is scriptural and still having all of this suspicion runs dangerously close to what Paul warned Timothy about when he said evil suspicions are a problem. Uh, and you know, long-held traditions gain authority in these kinds of scenarios based on the safety that they provide, right? It's, uh, and does that sound familiar? One of the arguments that is heard is, well, we've been doing this long time and it's tried and true and, uh, and it's, it's, it's just the safe way. Well, that's what, the, that's what they would have said back then. It says we're building a hedge around the law and we're trying to keep people from transgression. The safe, being safe and building a hedge around the law or binding what God has not bound. And it's not just procedural scripture like as far as what we do in the congregation. It can be making rules about morality. Uh, I've heard preaching about how it's wrong to go to the beach. It's like, can we boil that down just a little bit more? Uh, I've, I've heard preachers say, or the wearing of shorts. What in the world? We got we to gotta make sure that we're really talking about what we're supposed to be talking about here. Immodesty is one thing, but what kind of shorts are we talking about here? I mean, nothing was given there. Or the, the making of rules about the length with regard to uh, specific lines on the leg. Uh, we're talking about, we're talking about tradition and binding what God has not bound. And we need to establish those principles on the basis of other means than, than drawing lines for one another. Uh, of course, we understand why we don't host fellowship meals, but just simply saying that there's this, there's this rule about eating in the building, a uh, secret for you, I have lunch in here on Monday, or t Tuesday, I'm off on Monday, but I, I eat my lunch down here. Sh surely we can do better than eating in the building or women wearing pants. It'd be very easy to make rules in, in this regard, but I think we need to avoid that at all costs. Otherwise, to me, it's one and the same with what the Pharisees and scribes were doing. And, and then the phrase, uh, I just want to throw this out there. It's one that I've heard in the past as well. Well, um, yeah, okay, maybe everything that you're saying is fine and good, but uh, you know, there's no, no need to change for change sake. And I've dealt with in the past with churches that this was kind of a problem. And it makes you wonder, I, I wonder if there weren't scriptural options exercised a little more frequently than they are, maybe you wouldn't be having trouble <laughs> with this with this conversation right now. It's like so. There's the one perspective. Is, well, don't change that just just to change it. Well, yeah, sure, it should be for the better, as the elders are talking about, even making a change to the worship time as well. Uh, one of the advantages of actually implementing something like that is you make people realize that oh yeah, there are other options uh, that general authority present to us that are well within our rights to, to exercise as the congregation. My time is clearly expiring. I just want to conclude by saying, how do you know you've crossed the line in these things? As I said, I'm, I'm not proposing any changes uh, per se of any of the things that I've mentioned here. I'm very happy with the way things are. Uh, but we know we've crossed the line when we begin judging and being critical of others who are exercising their freedom to perform something that we can't say is unscriptural, but we need to be very careful about this, uh, this, this evil suspicion or thinking that it's only a matter of time before they have uh, gone off the deep end. Uh, and you've got a lesson, kind of, kind of, I don't know when, but uh, if you've looked at Joshua 22, where the half tribe, uh, the th two and a half tribes are building an altar on the east side of the Jordan River. 
one huge big misunderstanding that takes place, a lot of evil suspicion and judging that's going on and come to find out uh, the one side didn't know exactly what was going on there and they jumped to conclusions and if they had just taken the time to figure out what was going on they would have realized there was no need, to, no need for war, that, that everything was okay and that they were all on the same side and, uh, and thanks be to God that that worked out and that was the case. Of course, our purpose is to give glory to God, and that's why we examine things like this, so that we don't end up on the wrong end of tradition. We don't want to be married to tradition. We want to be married to Jesus and, and make sure that it's the right tradition, the tradition that came from God and the apostles. Uh, I do welcome any, uh, I do welcome any uh, input you've got or questions. Uh, I, I know that this is kind of a touchy subject. Uh, Sabbath and hand washing is so much easier than those kinds of things. But uh, look forward to hearing what Gardner Hall has to say about them as well. So hope that's helpful to our study that's coming up. And that might be a good opportunity for you to uh, mention what you'd like to talk about as well next Sunday morning. So appreciate your kind attention. We're going to conclude with a song of invitation. And... <laughs> Uh, we want to invite anyone in the audience this evening uh, to uh, think close, carefully about the words of the song. And uh, if you're convicted by the power of God's message, which is the power to save, we stand ready and arms open wide to welcome you uh, to the front so that we can help you. If you need to confess your faith in Jesus and be baptized or if you need to ask for prayers, we, we encourage you to come forward now while we stand and sing. <coughs> When Jesus comes to reward his servants, whether it be noon or night, faithful to him.